So I, I put an announcement about the exam in case, uh, and I already put it, I, I mean, I already set it up on the assignment. So available May 12, 1 p.m. to be uploaded May 13, 1 p.m. Kind of like, uh, I mean, uh, no, this, the same way we did the previous exam. Uh, by the way, I appreciate those of you that took the time to upload one file. I understand if you couldn't do it, that, that's okay too. Uh, it's just easier if it's only one file, but uh, it can be graded uh, equally well regardless. I added other, either comments or little notes on your exam. So if you have any problems that you got wrong, uh, check it. Realize how it, what was it that uh, it was not done correctly. And, um, and also, that is that I wanted to say, yeah, and, and uh, get the problems that you couldn't do, so solve them. And then uh, let's say Goldnass is asking, will we have review for the final exam? We can, uh, you, you may ask a few questions today, I think we're gonna have time. Uh, if that's what you mean by a review, then yes. If we're gonna have another new session for that, uh, no. And also, we won't have a sample final exam, but you all have the sample finals, I mean, the sample exams from last semester together with the two exams that we did. What I will do is upload uh, as, uh, solutions to the exam number two. Okay, that I will uh, do um, hopefully to later today or, or tomorrow. Okay, so, but definitely soon. So, solutions to exam number two. Okay, anything else? Oh, good. So let's uh, move it along. Um, so we, it's the, we're, we're finally near the end. So last class, we learned properties about the uh, Riemann integral, the familiar properties that we're used to, you know, like the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals, that the in integrals can take constants out, and other ones like the integral preserves inequalities, and also importantly that we could integrate the um, the inter the absolute value function. That that will be important for today's uh, pinnacle result, which is uh, the one that ties uh, integration with um, with derivatives. All right. So we have let me put it right here on the screen the so-called fundamental theorem of calculus. You're familiar with it because you used it all the time in your uh, lower division calculus class. And it says this over here. It says uh, this usually has two parts. Um, one of them is the, the first one is the one that you would uh, use the most, which is that if you have a, a function little f, which happens to be the derivative of a function capital F, then when you take the, the integral from A to B of little f, you simply need to evaluate the uh, capital function um, f on the endpoints, capital F of B minus capital F of A. Um, and that's super useful, right? Because then whenever we want to calculate a, an integral, what we do is find an antiderivative, find a function capital F whose derivative is little f. And then you, we can evaluate it. So it, the, the problem is then uh, translated into finding antiderivatives. So that's one of the versions. The other one is this one over here. If you define this capital G function, which is now has as a variable, uh, as a variable right here on top, this is important. Let me mark it. And right here on top, there's a variable, right? And so we're integrating now from a to x, the little function g. Well, this function over here turns out to be continuous. It's continuous in the entire interval a, v. And, uh, and um, more importantly, if the little function g happens to be continuous, if you integrate a continuous function, then the capital function G becomes differentiable. You can take its derivative. And more than that, when you take the derivative of the capital G function becomes the little g function. And we like to say that like uh, the derivative cancels the integral, right? It's the informal way in which we say this. If we take the derivative of this function G, the derivative cancels the integral and we get the little function G. 
Again, this under the assumption that the little function g is continuous uh, uh, at, a, at that specific point in which you're taking the derivative. Great. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to prove this. So we'll start with uh, the proof of 1. So proof of 1. So let, let me just uh, recall what is it that we are assuming. We are assuming that uh, capital F from the closed interval AB to R satisfies that it is differentiable and uh, the derivative of capital F is little f for all x in a b and then what we want to do is evaluate the interval so let's go to the page so these are our assumptions like I will just mention and then um, we'll we're gonna calculate the interval right so what is the interval let's recall so recall that the interval it's uh, the way we define it it's either uh, the upper interval or the lower interval interval because they're the same right and you need to remember that this u of f is the infimum of all the u f p over all partitions p And this LF is the supremum of all the LFP over all partitions P. Right? Remember that all the lower sums are smaller than the upper sums. That's nice. And uh, if they meet in the middle, that's the value of the interval, right? So uh, the, if the supremum and the, of the lower sums happens to be the infimum of the upper sums, then that's the value of the interval. That's the way we define it. Okay. So now let's uh, try to figure out what. Uh, so what is it that we have for this uh, specific um, for this specific function with these properties, right? So here's here's what we have. So we're gonna pick a partition, and we're gonna use the mean value theorem. Mm -hmm. So pick an arbitrary partition any partition so as usual suppose that p is uh, x0 less than x1 less than x2 less than xn and that this guy is b so we're picking an arbitrary partition and and then uh, because we know that the um, this uh, little f function is differentiable. This capital F function has a derivative, right? So because capital F uh, is differentiable, then it is continuous, obviously, because differentiable implies continuous. And then by the mean value theorem, this happens if we do the uh, f of x k or oh, i'm going to say on which interval on the interval x k minus one x k what happens if i apply the mean value theorem to that interval well it tells me that f x k minus capital f of x k minus one divided by x k minus x k minus one this is the derivative of some point in between, right? Of some CK that uh, belongs to the interval XK minus one XK. In fact, it's open here, not that it matters, but let's write it the correct way. Good. Is that, is that uh, correct? So we've applied the mean value theorem. It's the only thing we've done. And, and uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the difference. Um, so we're going to multiply by these, which is non zero because these are different. So then this happens. We can write down f prime of, uh, let me start from the left, the way it's written. 
f of xk minus f of xk minus 1 is going to be f prime of ck times xk minus xk minus 1. But here's the thing, right? Now we, we had to use our assumption. So what do we know about this f prime, uh, this capital F prime? Well, that's uh, exactly our assumption, right? So right here at the top, we need to remember that the derivative of capital F is little f. So that's how we're going to replace this one over here by assumption is just little f. Okay, and this is going to be useful because now we can use this to try to calculate the interval, right? If you remember the, uh, and the definition of upper sums and lower sums, this quantity appears, right? So let's leave this one, uh, let's mark it as star or one, maybe we're gonna have more than one, so let's call this identity one, this equation. And then let's uh, try to remember uh, what is it that we know. So what if, what if I use, if I take this quantity and I add all of them? Mm -hmm. Well, in general, so in general, so note that, If I take f of ck, that value for sure is smaller than little, uh, capital MK and bigger than little MK, right? Now, you're wondering, what are these little MK and, and capital MK? Let's recall where little MK is the infimum of f of x over all the x's in the interval xk minus 1 xk and capital M is the supremum. So why is this true? Well, because this is one of them, right? This ck belongs to this interval and f of ck is then one of these numbers. So of course any of these numbers is, is smaller than the supremum because the supremum is an upper bound and it's bigger than the infimum because the infimum is a lower bound. So this is true in general for every CK, right? Mm -hmm. So then I can multiply by XK minus XK minus one both sides. And then I add all of this from one to N, right? I mean, this is true for any uh, interval uh, XK minus one XK. So now let's put them all together, right? So if I add all of them from one to n is less than or equal than if I add all of these, which is less than or equal than if I add all of these. And now here comes the beauty part. Well, what is this guy over here? This is precisely the definition of the upper sum. Right? That's how you do the upper sum. You use the supremum in each uh, with the partition P. And this is the definition of the lower sum. Right? So this guy in the center is sandwiched uh, between these two. Uh, but also, let's remember what this, this guy is, right? If you go back to one, right? If, if you go back to identity one right here, you'll notice that this quantity, let me box it in orange, is the same as F capital XK minus F capital XK minus one. So I'm gonna replace it here. And then uh, I'm just gonna tell you that that's a telescopic sum, right? So this is capital F XK minus capital F XK minus one from one to N. Well, this is a telescopic sum, right? So because you do uh, f of x1 minus f of x0, then f of x2 minus f of x1, so the x1s go away. Then f of, f of x3 minus f of x2, so now the x2s go away, etc. So only two terms survive, the largest one positive and the smallest one negative. So this is the same as f of xn minus f of x0, which is actually b and a. They are actually B and A. 
So this number in between is f of b minus f of a, right? So summarizing what we've done so far, we have the following. L of fp is less than or equal f of b minus f of a, which is less than or equal u of fp. For any partition, right? For any partition. Well, this happens for any partition. Then in particular, so if this inequality holds, so let's recall again. So all of these numbers are smaller than this, right? So then the supremum, so this is an upper bound, f of b minus f of a is an upper bound for all of these numbers. So therefore, uh, and the supremum is the least of the upper bounds. So it, it follows that um, L of F, because that's the supremum of all of these guys, is still smaller than F of B minus F of A, because this is the least of the upper bounds. Similarly, on the right-hand side, uh, this is a lower bound of the upper sum. And the infimum of the upper sums is U of F, and the infimum is the greatest of the of the uh, of the upper bounds. So the because it's the greatest, it has to beat this other upper bound. So this happens in general, yes. But then this guy is the integral, right? This guy is the integral of um, um, there's something not right here. Yes. Yeah, so this my bad. It should be, I don't know, it's correct. So this is, uh, this is the integral, and so is this one. And because this number is sandwiched in between two numbers that are the same, then the conclusion follows. And that's the end of half uh, the proof, right? So we have just proved that uh, the first part of a fundamental theorem. If you find, uh, to do the integral of little f, if you know little f is the derivative of capital F, then you can do capital F of B minus capital F of A and be done with it. All right? Uh, questions so far before I move on to the second part? Okay, let's move to the second part. So for the second part, so for part two, this time uh, we we'll, uh, remember, recall that. So we're, we're defining uh, this function g, g of x, which is the integral from a to x of little f. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we are assuming that, um, well, let me, the book uses little g here, so let me just be consistent with the book. So the, we define it this way, and what we know is that the function g is integrable on the interval a, b. So we know this, and uh, the first part to, is to show that if capital, um, that this capital function g is continuous. So first, we prove that capital G is continuous. So if you have anything here that's, in, that's integrable, the, when you do this, capital G becomes continuous. All right? So how do we do this? Well, we're going to pick a partition. Um, so we're, we're going to prove more, in fact. We're going to show uniform continuity. Okay? We're going to show that it's not only continuous, it's going to be, well, it's not surprising because this is a closed interval, right? If it's going to be continuous uh, on the closed interval a, b, because the closed interval is compact, then it will be uniformly continuous. Okay, so that's not that surprising. But uh, we're going to prove that it is uniformly continuous uh, right away. Mm -hmm. So here's how we do it. So we're going to pick two numbers, y and x, here. Uh, and, and we're going to assume, without loss of, of generality, that the one is smaller than the other, so uh, y is less than x. Okay? So then let's uh, calculate what is the function g. g of uh, x minus g of y. What is this? 
Well, by definition, this is the integral from a to x of the little function g, and this is the integral of a to y of the function little g, right? And then um, you may remember what we learned uh, last class. Uh, we can separate this into two integrals. We can separate this into the integral from, so let's see, let's make a little picture here. So we have, here's A. And uh, here's B, and we have Y and X. So the integral from A to X, I can separate from as the integral from A to Y plus the integral from Y to X. So this will be the integral from A to Y plus the integral from Y to X minus the integral from A to Y. This obviously cancels. So all I'm left with is the absolute value of the integral from Y to X. Okay, so far so good. Well then, so let me put it here. This is the integral from y to x. And then I'm going to use uh, again what we did last class. So the, the last one we did, the triangle inequality for integrals. So this will be less than or equal than the integral from y to x of the absolute value of the function g, right? And uh, why are we doing this? Well, because this function g, uh, because it's integrable, right? Remember, when we started a discussion about integrable functions, we assume right away that they're bounded, right? If they're unbounded, we cannot do the integral, right? So in particular, this function is bounded. So let's just put it here. Recall that g is bounded. Say by m. So this means that the absolute value of g is less than m for every x. So this number is less than m. The absolute value of g is less than m. So this is len less than m, uh, less than the integral from y to x of the function m. And uh, we know an antiderivative of this function, the antiderivative is m, mx, right, or mt, right? And so this is precisely m times x minus 1. Professor, can you move the paper to the side so that we can see the... Sure. Thank you. Let me move the camera a little bit up. Yeah, thanks. It's, I don't see that part because that's where I have the chat uh, window. So thank you for telling me. Good. So uh, so we, we have this. And uh, now this may remind you of um, if this may this may remind you of our exam, our exam, the first problem. It's a it's a very similar to that. Right. Once you have an inequality like this, then uh, you can make you can let x and y be closer to guarantee that these two are close right and uh, so now you pick an arbitrary epsilon i think almost i believe not probably all of you did this problem correctly so if you pick an arbitrary epsilon um uh, we we set delta to be epsilon over m. Mm -hmm. Then, if the absolute value of x minus y is less than delta, delta is actually epsilon over m, then this happens. g of x minus g of y, which we calculated as less than m times x minus y. This is, by the way, positive. So x minus, remember, x was greater than y. So this, is, this does not require absolute value, but if you want, we can put it in. So this is less than epsilon over m. The m's go away, and this is less than epsilon. 
So for an arbitrary epsilon, if x and y are closer, then g of x and g of y are closer. And the delta does not depend on x or on y, so we just prove that g is uniformly continuous. Mm -hmm. So capital G is uniformly continuous on A. Beautiful. All right. So that's the first part. The second part, uh, more important part we need to show is that if G, little g is continuous, so for the second part, assume little g is continuous, we need to prove that the derivative with respect to, um, how, how should I write it? I'll write it with primes. We uh, assume G is continuous. At C, we need to prove that G prime of C is little g of C. All right, so that's the second part we want to show. So let's, that's that, let's proceed like we would, right? So how do you show that the derivative is anything? You go to the definition, right? So let's go to the definition. What's the definition of G prime? Mm -hmm. I'll just get a new piece of paper here. So here's the definition of G prime. So by definition, what is G prime of C? If it exists, right? If it exists, it would be this limit. It would be the limit when X approaches C of g of x minus g of c divided by x minus c. And what is this? Well, let's work it out. It will be the limit when x approaches c. Let me leave this hanging. And then this will be g of x is the integral from a to x of little g. And uh, g of c is the integral from a to c of little g. And just as we did for the previous problem, so I'm not going to repeat the, uh, the little drawing here, you can uh, replace this. So it's from A to X minus the one from A to C. So it's like from C to X, right? So this is the limit of one over X minus C times the integral from C to X of G, right? And if you want, um since let's put the variable here i mean uh, the book tries to keep it as clean as possible so they avoid cluttering the expressions with lots and lots of uh, variables but in this case since we have so many things then we may as well put the variable of integration here the dummy variable for this thing. so this is the derivative and uh, we, we would like to evaluate it and more than that we would like to show that the answer is going to be c so here it turns out that the best way to show that this limit exists and it equals C is to look at the difference. So show instead that this minus that is zero, right? So in other words, that the limit of this minus the constant G of C is zero. So that's what we're gonna consider, all right? So let's leave this uh, hanging for a moment. Let me call it two, that's our second uh, equation. And instead, let's, take, let's consider the following. So I'm gonna put absolute value bars because I wanna make it tiny. And so it's this expression minus the constant G of C. All right? Okay, so I wanna make this tiny. And how am I going to make it tiny? Well, now first, I'm going to replace this G of C. I want to write this as an integral so that I can combine it with this other one over here. And it's actually a very simple uh, uh, trick, all right? So let's, this will continue later. But for now, observe the following. See, uh, G of C, I can write it as, well, of course, I can write it as G of C times uh, divided by X minus C multiplied by X minus C because x will approach c so it's not equal to c so this is not zero so then i can multiply and divide by it right it's like a one 
And the reason I'm doing this is because I can write it now as follows. I can write a g of c over x minus c. And then this x minus c, I'm going to write it as the integral of the function 1 from c to x. Right? Is that clear? If I do this integral, what is the integral of 1? t. And then you evaluate t from x to c, so it will be x minus c, precisely that, right? It's a simple, simple uh, thing that we're doing here, right? And then because this is a constant, I can put it inside. So this is actually the same as 1 over x minus c, the integral from c to x of g of c, right? And I like this expression a lot because it looks a lot like this other one over here, right? Look how similar they are. The only difference is that this one does have a variable here, g of t, and this one has a constant. This is just a number, right, that I can take in and out of the integral. But I like it like this because then I can put this expression in here and combine the two integrals. So we'll continue now. So this equal sign now will become, over here, the following. It will be 1 over x minus c, this integral that we had from before, minus this new expression that we found for g of c. That looks a lot like the same thing. With the difference that it has a c here, right? It's a constant. Okay, and uh, this is good because now I can combine this into one single integral, right? And uh, I can factor the 1 over x minus c, and the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. So using those properties, I can rewrite this as 1 over x minus c, the integral from c to x of g of t minus g of c. Right? One big integral. Now remember, my goal is to make this zero, to make this as small as possible when x gets close to c, right? We want to show that this limit will be zero. So to do that, uh, I want to make this tiny. So now I'm going to use the triangle inequality that we learned last time. So this is, will be the same as, uh, by the triangle inequality, 1 over x minus c, uh, we're, as we remember that, or maybe I should have a, like this, 1 over x minus c, I don't know if it's positive or negative. <coughs> the integral from c to x uh, of the absolute value of g of t minus g of c. Okay, now... Time to use my assumption. What was my assumption? We haven't uh, get, gone into that part, right? What was the assumption here? The assumption, it was that little g is continuous at c. So let's, uh, it's time to recall that. So recall that little g is continuous at c, right? What is the meaning of that? Uh, let's write it here. Um, this means that for every epsilon, there is delta such that if t minus c is less than delta, then g of t minus g of c is less than epsilon, right? And we, this is the part we want to use. So we pick an epsilon now. We pick an arbitrary epsilon. So pick an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. Then there is delta greater than zero uh, as a vote. I'm not gonna repeat it, so that, but this happens, right? But the important property to have in mind here is that this inequality, now I can tag over here, right? Therefore, so if I go back to the beginning, this expression that we wanted, which is equal to this, which is equal to this, which is less than or equal to that, all right, that expression, 
I write it over here again. That expression is less than or equal the integral from c to x. And what do I have here? Just epsilon. Yeah, but what is the integral of just epsilon? Well, it's epsilon t. Or the epsilon I can take out, whatever way you prefer. And then I have the integral of 1 from c to x, which is x minus c. Um, and these guys go away, and we get epsilon. So in summary, what is it that we prove? We prove that for every epsilon, there is a delta such that if x and uh, if c and t are closer than so, uh, than delta, then this integral minus g of c are closer than epsilon, right? And well, there's there's one thing that uh, we're missing here. So so I want to I, I should have said uh, there's a, a slight point that I need to make. So. We can arbitrary, uh, so, um, so there is delta as a bulb, and if x minus c is less than delta, then t minus c is less than delta, because t is even, t is between x and c, right? We're going to integrate between c and x, so t is between x and c. So if x minus c is less than delta, then t minus c is also less than delta. Then in fact, they're even smaller, All right? So let me summarize what we just did. So in summary, in summary, if uh, for every epsilon greater than zero, If x minus c um, so my bad, just a moment. There is a delta for every epsilon. There is delta greater than zero, such that this happens. X minus c less than delta implies this expression is less than epsilon, right? That's what we just proved in summary. So if x and c are closer than delta, then this side is closer than epsilon. So that's a limit definition. That means this limit when x approaches c is zero, right? The limit when x approaches c of this expression minus the constant g of c is zero. Well, but if that happens, that means this is just a constant and the limit of uh, the difference of two things. Uh, so this limit is zero and the limit of G of C is G of C. Because that's just a constant. So the limit when X approaches C of G of C is just G of C. That's a constant function. So if you have two limits that exist, the sum exists. So by the algebraic limit theorem, the sum of these two limits exists. And when you add the G of C cancels, so you simply get one over X minus C, G of T dt, and this will be G of C. Great, so we just proved this limit exists and it equals g of c. So now we can go back to the very beginning and do the very beginning when we tried to figure out the derivative, let me put it back. This is what we did. We showed at the very beginning that the derivative of c, if it existed, was this limit. But guess what? We just proved this limit exists. So we have just proved that the derivative exists. And more than that, we, we found the value of this limit. The value was little g of c. Mm -hmm. So we are done. So therefore, by two, by identity two, the one that we left behind, g prime of c 
was this limit precisely. Um, and so by identity two, we just prove this limit exists. And not only does this limit exist, it equals G of C. And that's the end, All right? So what is it that we used? Again, let's summarize it. We use that uh, the function was continuous at the point C, right? So we use continuity to guarantee that uh, when, uh, when, let's go back here. We use continuity to guarantee that uh, this expression became smaller when C and X are close to each other. That, that was essentially it. Mm -hmm. That's the key idea of the proof. And that, that's it, right? Uh, I know if you, if you think about it, you realize that, hey, professor, we've done harder things like this theorem. This, this theorem doesn't seem that hard. I mean, uh, the notation is kind of difficult because there's the limit and the interval, but in reality, the ideas are simple. Well, uh, yes, you would be right about that, but uh, you need to realize that we are using lots of results uh, that we developed earlier, right? In this proof, we used all the properties of integrals that we learned before, like the integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals that we can take constants in and out, the triangle inequality, that the integral from A to B plus the integral from B to C is the same as the integral from A to C. We use all of that. We also use the mean value theorem. And how did we prove the mean value theorem? Well, that in itself was based on, on previous theorems and so on, right? So we really developed a building throughout the semester. And right now that we're enjoying the fruits of our labor, it doesn't seem that hard. But you need to realize that it is all based on the foundations of the previous work that we did uh, earlier. Okay? So, um, any questions? Okay, good. So we are done with um, the material actually. So like I told you last class, this, um, this section was uh, kind of small. Doesn't have a lot of um, pages. It's barely three pages, I believe. So uh, we were gonna have one more time. So if you have specific questions, problems that you have been stuck with you can solve uh things that you would like to know this is this would be the time to to ask them no questions we're geniuses professor we got 85 on the midterms <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's take a look uh, let me put the uh, where is it the book yeah, let's, I mean, you haven't taken a look at this. So let's, let's work on one of these just for kicks. So, um, well, uh, number one is very, very easy. I mean, we can try it, but I think that would be a waste of our time. The number one is extremely easy. And you can, you don't need to know much about it. But so let's take a look at two. Uh, let's see. Where's, let me put it, I didn't share it, I, I thought I did. Um, okay, better. So number one is uh, really straightforward. So you have the absolute value function and you want to integrate it and see what it looks when you integrate it and you just need to do the integral and break it down where it's not continue, where, where uh, you know, the two different values of absolute value. So it's not, it's not a difficult thing to, to do. Um, we could do it if you want, but it's, it's that, that one is actually quite simple. Let's take a look at this number two, for example. Um, uh, I like this one, it's true or false, because if we check if we, if we understand um, what we're doing here or not. So, True or false, if it's true, uh, justify it. If it's not, well, give me a counterexample, right? So here's the first one. If G is some derivative function, um, 
So what we're doing, if G, if G is the derivative for some uh, function H on the closed interval AB, then G is continuous. Is that true or false? Just take a guess, put it on the chat. Okay, so you need to be careful here. So the statement is, is it about G or is it about H? Right? So if, re, if I replace A by H, if I say then H is continuous, then it would be true because H prime exists, right? If something has a derivative, then it is continuous. So if it had said H over here instead of G, uh, then it would be true. But right now, the way it, it's, uh, it's actually false, right? It's false. And uh, why do we know it's false? Well, because uh, we did it here in class, no? We showed a function that uh, had a derivative uh, that, that was the derivative of some function, but it wasn't continuous, right? Uh, remember that one? What was the example? Says uh, you can have a piecewise continuous function as um, Justin says you can have a piecewise continuous functions like absolute value of x. Uh, you want that for for uh, for g or for h? Uh, because absolute value wouldn't work, right? So if we put absolute value of x for say uh, h then um, then uh, the derivative doesn't exist at zero, right, Justin? So we, like, we cannot use absolute value because the derivative is, does not exist at zero. Mm -hmm. So let me write it here. So the question is, if g is h prime, Is it true that G is continuous? And we'll go to the page. So uh, Justin uh, proposed that, what about absolute value, right? So if, if H of X is absolute value of X, remember this means X greater than X, if X is positive, negative x if x is negative and the graph of a function looks like a v right like this now in which interval do you want to do it probably in one that includes zero right say on the interval negative one one and it would almost work because what's the derivative the derivative of h of h is one if x is greater than zero and negative one if x is less than zero the problem is the derivative does not exist right here, right? We have a corner point. It doesn't have a derivative at zero. So then this function does not satisfy this assumption, right? This function does, uh, I mean the G, so if you make G this one, yes, it's not continuous, but it's also not satisfying the first part. Is that clear? Why this does not work as a counterexample? This doesn't work as a counterexample. So what is a counterexample? Well, you need to go back to when we looked at Darboux's theorem, right? Why did we study Darboux's theorem? Because derivatives have the intermediate value property, but they're not necessarily continuous, right? Being continuous and having the intermediate value property is not the same, right? So here's uh, the example that could work. So the example that shows that this is false actually false the example is I think let's see what was it it was G so I'm gonna start with H so H I think the one that works is X square sine of 1 over X if X is not 0 0 if X is 0 right 
And how do we show this is uh, differentiable on the interval negative one, one? It really doesn't matter. Any interval that includes zero. Why does this one work? Well, because what's the derivative? Um, if, if, the, if the function is not zero, you can simply use this and use the product rule or whatever, right? So the derivative will be 2x times sine of 1 over x plus x squared times cosine of 1 over x times the derivative of 1 over x, which is negative 1 over x squared, if x is not zero. So it works. It is differentiable because each piece is differentiable and the product of differentiable is differentiable and the product will work. So this, this is good. So the only one we're missing is zero, right? So zero we need to do separately. So h prime of zero would be the limit when x approaches zero of h of x minus h of zero over x minus zero. And this by definition is x squared sine one over x minus zero over x minus zero. The x's go away. That's x times sine of one over x. We did this limit before in class. We showed that it is zero. Essentially because sine of one over x is bounded by one, right? Uh, this is again uh, like uh, our exam problem number uh, one, right? This function is bounded by one and this one goes to zero, therefore the product goes to zero. So this is exactly, exactly uh, problem two in, uh, problem one in exam two. Exam two, problem one. So this limit is zero. Uh, so the derivative at zero exists, right? So h prime exists. Hence, h prime exists on negative one, one. So you can call it g, but is the derivative continuous? That's the question, right? Is this function continuous? And it's not going to be continuous because what happens to this when we approach zero? is not continuous. Why? At zero. Everywhere else it is, but at zero it fails. Why? Because what is the limit when h prime, when x approaches zero? Well, it would be the limit of 2x sine of 1 over x minus cosine of 1 over x. Now this part goes to zero, That's, that part's fine. So this goes to zero, but this one oscillates between negative one and one, right? It's like it goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So this limit does not exist, does not exist. You want to very be very precise. Uh, you, well, we already know this limit is zero. So you can break this as zero plus the limit or minus the limit of cosine one over x. And to sh properly show this one doesn't exist, you can show me two sequences that go, both go to zero, and yet this goes to different things. And you can use the sequence xn, um, 2 pi n, and the, sequ the sequence uh, yn, two pi n plus pi. So if you use this sequence, this will, uh, this number will be, oh my bad, one over that. So that it goes to zero, right? One over that. So then when you do the cosine, this will be cosine of two pi or two or four pi or six pi. And that is going to be one. But if you plug it in here, it will be negative one. So you cannot have two sequences whose answers tell, uh, take you to different places. So this limit doesn't exist, all right? So uh, derivatives are not necessarily uh, continuous, okay? Derivatives have the intermediate value property, but they're not necessarily continuous. That's the moral of this one, right? So the answer was false. How about uh, the other ones here? Uh, the next one, it says now if G is continuous, then g is the uh, the derivative of some function. How about that one? True or false? 
Mm-hmm. Benjamin says true. Mm-hmm. It is true, that one. Uh, we just learned about it, right? What is the function that works? Well, the function that works is uh, the following. So let me write it here. <laughs> if G is continuous on A, B, then G is H prime. Is it true or not? And um, it is true, and we just learned about it, right? So the function that works is the following true. You just let h of uh, x or, or h of x to be the integral from a to x of g of t dt. You create this function and what did we just learn? It was just a problem uh, that uh, we just did, right? If this function is continuous in a b then when we take the derivative by the fundamental theorem of calculus h prime is g of x that's exactly what we want right so it doesn't matter uh, about uh, yeah so if it is continuous it works um, yeah and uh, even if it, if it is not continuous, if it only has finitely many discontinuities, this could still work, right? But so so that one is correct. Um, about uh, part uh, last one, part C says if this is differentiable at C in A B, then the function H is continuous. Is that, uh, is that one right or wrong? Mm -hmm. And Reinick says not true, right? Yeah, it's not true, it's false. And you learned your lesson, right, uh, from the previous one. So what this one says is that the derivative of H, capital H, is little h. So little h it will be a derivative. By the fundamental theorem, little h will be a derivative. But derivatives are not necessarily continuous, right? So we could use the same example as before. We can use as our little h, the function we came up, the x squared sine 1 over x, 0. That one, is, that one is, uh, the, the derivative of that one is not continuous. So I, I, I guess we need the derivative of that one, right? So we want, let me show it to you. No paper. Let's say. So we want to use, let me write it here first, C if capital H from A to X is differentiable at C in AB, then H is continuous at C. All right, so let's uh, do it. This one is false. And let's uh, use as C zero. And our H is going to be the one we did before, the derivative of the one we did before, not the one we did before. So this one over here, the derivative, the derivative we found before. So H prime will be, so H will be uh, two X sine one over X minus cosine one over X if X is not zero and zero if X is zero. So this one is not continuous at zero. 
h is not continuous at zero. We did it before. But if you do capital H as this, uh, this one is differentiable because because h is the derivative of some function, right? So h is the derivative of some function. h is the derivative of, uh, but since h uh, is the derivative of, how do I write it? h is g prime, where g is x squared sine of one over x, if x is not zero and zero if x is zero. So h is the derivative of this one, so there, therefore this one is actually g, g of x, right? And it is differentiable. It is differentiable everywhere. So the capital H function is differentiable everywhere, but the derivative is not necessarily continuous, okay? That's uh, what we're learning. Mm -hmm. So these subtle points between the, uh, the derivatives being able to be continuous or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I have like five more minutes. What else can we do? Um, how about this one? Uh, number four. If we have a function that is continuous and this is zero for every x, then the function is zero. Uh, Benjamin is asking, will we be tested on section 5.4? Uh, not really because, I mean, it's technically included, but if you take a look at all the problems in 5.4, they're all like part of constructing this complicated function that we talked about for two classes, the one that was uh, continuous but not differentiable. So it will be, um, I mean, I couldn't put it in individual context, right? All these problems, one problem is based on the previous one and on the previous one, so it would be, if I included any of those, you would need to do all of them. And that would be pointless because you can go back and just copy the way I did them in class. So technically included, uh, but not really. I mean, I'm not gonna ask you any questions from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see if we can do this one. Did I say I left comments on our submission for exam two? Yes, uh, so if you open up your actual exam, the, the file itself, it has annotations uh, on top of, of, of them or, or comments on the, on the rubric of whatever it is that you got wrong. Mm -hmm. Good, so let's see what this one says. It says uh, little f is continuous and the interval of little f is zero for every x. Then we need to show that the function itself is zero on a, b. And then it says provide an example to show that this conclusion is not true if f is not continuous. All right, so that, I think that part is the harder part. So here we know f from a to b, from the interval a, b to r, continuous. And the interval is zero for all x in a, b. All right, so let's do the first part at least. That will be easy. So we have this assumption. Okay, so the function is continuous and this happens. So then what happens when the function is continuous is we can take the derivative, right? So then by the fundamental theorem of calculus, so let capital F be the integral from A to X of little f. Because little f is continuous, then capital F is differentiable and capital F of C equals little f of C, right? But what is capital F? 
capital F is zero, right? Is the zero function. And what's the derivative of zero? The derivative of zero is zero, right? So that means that little f is zero for every c in a. And that, that's the first part, right? Now, uh, the second part, I don't know if we're gonna have enough time, but let's see at least. So it says, give an example to show that this is not true if little f is not continuous, right? And uh, the harder part would be to find one of these functions who's, uh, which, that the integral is zero all the time, right? And uh, so the example, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I can't really do it uh, completely. It's part of your other problems. But if you remember the Tomai function, this, what, this one was the one that looked kind of like a Christmas tree, right? It was uh, 1 over n if x is m over n. And with n positive and uh, the fraction is simplified. So for rational numbers, you do one over the denominator if the denominator is positive. And for irrational number is zero. That's the Tomai function, right? It looked like a lot of values, zeros, and then some little ones that have some dots up and down. And uh, you can check that this, the integral of this function is, this function is integrable. I mean, it has a lot of discontinuities, but you can integrate it. It's one of your all, uh, problems in section 7.2, I believe. So uh, the integral from the, for the function h is zero uh, all over the place in any, any two for any a and b. It's zero all the time. And uh, however, this function does not have a derivative, right? It is not even continuous, right? So th this function is not continuous and it's not zero all the time. I guess that's what it means. So the, even though the integral is zero all the time, the function itself is not zero. Sometimes it's one over n. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, the, that's the counterexample. Mm -hmm. All right. That's, I think, all the time we have for today. So, and if you have any uh, questions, uh, you, you can still shoot me an email. We'll find out uh, anything else that you may be wondering about. And so start studying, be ready, and um, do well. I am hoping that uh, you're gonna all pass the class, all of you that have survived and, and have kept uh, with the class. Uh, so stay safe. It was uh, certainly a pleasure to have you guys. I know this was difficult, but uh, I think we made it work. And all right, guys, I'm going to have to leave you because I have another class to teach right after this one. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Professor. Take care. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye.